Where are we this morning? Oh, we're in the Gospel of John. A couple of weeks back, I did a uh, sermon and we were talking about Jesus is our mentor. You need to have a mentor. You cannot find a man that is going to be a spiritual mentor that comes near what Jesus does for us. So to make Jesus your mentor, you need to treat him as, and you should memorize a few of these sevens that we find in the Gospel of John. There's, there's seven sevens, so pick a couple to memorize. But the ones that you need to know, understand for as far as Jesus being your mentor is, he is the bread of life. That comes out of John chapter six. He's the light of life, the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the light, the way, the truth and the life, the true vine. Now, that's the seven, and that's the seven ways you need to look at Jesus, because he's the one that's going to feed us. He's the one that's going to lead us. So if you get into the word of God, he can be your mentor. If you don't get into the word of God, John chapter, what, 8, 31 and 32, if you are disciples of mine, you shall abide in the word, you'll know the word, and the word will set you free, right? And if you're not in the word, then you're not going to be set free. But in that list of seven uh, of, of seven things that we have to make Jesus as our uh, to make Jesus our, our mentor, there's one word that pops out in those that list that I just gave you. And it's an interesting word that I think we don't understand the concept of very well. And it's the word life. You know, I'm the bread of life, the light of life, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life. All the others are, are singular, but the, the light is repeated four times in that list of seven things. And if you look at John chapter 10, 10, what did Jesus come to give us? Abundant life. And I think we don't understand that the life he's talking about, yes, it's eternal life, right? First John chapter five, verse 13, these things I've written to you so that you can know that you have eternal life. That life is what we have now. We have eternal life. But when you become a Christian, you go from this mortal, physical life that we had as, as, as people in, that were lost in the darkness, and God has given us this new life. We are these new creatures, and we need to see that we're walking in a new life. And if we don't, then we're going to mess up, because too many of us have the tendency to become a Christian, and we stay with the same standards. We stay with the same goals, and we're not understanding that God has raised us up spiritually and set us in the heavenlies. We've got totally different goals. We got totally different things that satisfy us. You've got to learn to change your expectations out of this life. We come to Christ as sick and broken people. Everybody was sick and broken. And don't tell me you were. We were plugged into the world and we were sick and tired. That's why we came to Christ. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and verse 30, Jesus is calling for us. Come to me, you who are weary heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke. There's a work to do. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle, humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. But there's a work that we have to do. And we have to change the yoke of what the world put on us. And we have to take on the yoke that God puts, up, puts upon us. Jesus offers us a new hope. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But how to obtain this life that he's talking about? Well, right off the bat, in Matthew chapter 16, he's demanding obedience. Everybody just says, oh, you just got to believe in Jesus, right? Just got to get back. And then that's it. It's a walk in the park. Well, he demands obedience and he demands rather strict obedience in chapter 16, verse 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, he's got to deny himself, take up his cross, Follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will a profit a man if he gains the world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for a soul? We've got to change our goals. We've got to change, change what we're looking at. Quit serving self and start serving Christ. In Luke chapter 14, I'm just turning there. He says pretty much the same thing. 
But I, I like what he's what he says there. Um, Luke 14, what am I looking for? Oh, I'm looking for 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, his own life cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple, right? Cannot be my disciple. That's a pretty nasty statement. He's saying you've got to change. You've got to learn to listen to me. You've got to take me on as the mentor or you cannot be my disciple. You want this new life that he's offering? Then you have to, what? You've got to learn to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross and you've got to follow him. He's the good shepherd. He's the one that we need to listen to. So right off the bat, before you even think about being a disciple, he's saying, count the cost. Are you ready to lay your life down for my sake? Count the cost. Point number two that Jesus gets into about this new life. He teaches us the greatest commandment. Matthew 22, 37 to 40, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. All your heart, all soul, all your mind. And your neighbor as yourself. And in Mark, he says, love the love Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And your neighbor as yourself. We're created in God's image. We've got th three parts. We've got the 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 spirit. The, the we've got spirit, soul, and and body. And so, so those three parts are the intelligence. We've got emotions, and we got intelligence, emotions, and we got imagination. Those are the three things created in God's image. Mark adds the fourth part: mm -hmm. your strength. If you're well balanced in the three, then you've got free will if you've only got one of those things if you're just an emotional person then you don't have free will because you're a prisoner to your emotions or you're a prisoner to your intelligence or you're a prisoner right to your imagination you got to learn to be balanced in all three three of those things so you make wise decisions that's why jesus is saying look no you've got to love me with all your heart soul mind strength don't just love me with your emotions you know Pentecostalism, pure emotional, that's all you got to do. But there's no digging in the scriptures. But you can't just love me with the scriptures, with your intelligence, because that's almost like a, you know, Anglicanism where there's no emotion. You got to have emotion in church. You've got to have a love for God. You've got to use your imagination, right? Or the church is going to die. The people are going to die. We have to bring in all four of those things. So we make wise decisions. The book of Matthew, and, I, and I was, I'm doing this in my class, so this is, makes it easier for me to, to yell or preach, not preach, just yell, right? But Matthew is the gospel that's written for, specifically, for your emotions. He's trying to get your, get your emotions under control. And at the end of it, because people that are emotional, people that are the S personality style, they love to help other people, teachers, nurses. Anybody in the service industry are usually big S type personalities. And, and he makes the, you know, and in, in, in Matthew, he's going with emotions and logic, emotions and logic. He's trying to say, okay, here's your emotions. And he balances it with logic. So he's trying to show you, you can get your emotions under control. And then, then at the very end with the great commission, he appeals to the person with that S personality who likes to help people by saying, go make disciples, go help people, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, right? I like to help people. I can go make disciples, right? So he appeals to them. That's the, that's the, that's the gospel of Matthew. John, it's all about imagination, which is what we just read. I am. The resurrection. I am the bread of life. I am, right? It, all those are, you got to use your imagination to see what he's trying to get through to us. You know, feed my, and so in at the end, he says, for the great commission, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my lambs. Well, what's he talking about? Well, if you really want to love me, if you want to agape me, you're going to start working with the church and you're going to start feeding the brothers and the sisters. When you do that, you're going to go from phileo, which is what Peter was saying, 
to agape, which is where God wants us to be. But you're only going to learn that when you're dealing with brothers and sisters, when you're dealing with the church, right? And, and, and also for the imagination, you know, we have that ability to what? Change water into wine. We can teach people what the Old Testament is trying to say and, 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 and excite their imagination. That's what you want to do with, with, the, with the Gospel of John. In Luke, it's all about intelligence. And Luke only, not only gives us the, the Gospel of Luke, but he's also giving us the Book of Acts. And he's trying to get us to start thinking deeper. Use your brain. Start putting stuff together. And, and he he's always says in, in, the, in the Book of Acts, let's reason together from the Old Testament. You can't just read it and say, that's what it says. You've got to read it and say, what is God trying to say? What's the lesson that's coming out of this lesson right here? Luke is so full of parables. There's a teaching in a parable. It's not just a parable. There's a spiritual lesson in parables that you want to pull out. And it takes a mind of intelligence to help accomplish those things. Mark, he's about strength. Quick, short, fast to the point. He's about making decisions. You know, he's the surest of the gospel and he gives you 15 examples in each of the, of the, of the chapters. This is what you need to do or this is what you shouldn't do. He does give negative examples, but he teaches us faith, hope, love. Here's the example of what you need to accomplish. And, and at the end of Mark, he finishes it by just simply leaving it with, with the, the ladies are scared because they've seen the resurrected Lord. Um, in, in Mark chapter, if you want to turn in Mark chapter 16, from 14 on, it, it's questionable, right? No, from chap uh, verse 9 on, it's questionable whether that belongs in the Gospel of Mark. And in your Bibles, you'll see square brackets, right? And then at the bottom footnote, it'll say early manuscripts didn't have this in their Bibles. So the last verse in Mark chapter 16, verse 8 was, the women went out, fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. They went out. What did they do? Well, it doesn't matter what they did. What are you going to do? Because now you understand the resurrection did take place. The tomb was empty and you should have fear and trembling running through because Jesus did come back from the, the dead. There has been a resurrection. And he's calling for us to do something. And what does Mark want you to do? Make that decision and do what you need to accomplish to have a relationship with Christ. The four gospels teaching us how to use our mind. So we're running on four cylinders, right? He cares about you enough to help you because we're broken units, right? I was a flying high eye personality and I didn't even know how to think. And I never did think. That's how I could get caught up in the world of drugs and alcohol, right? Some people, you know, are totally different. We're all different. But the gospel's trying to help us so that we're solid for the rest of our lives so we can be of a good influence, right? So we can live this life abundantly. It's not about eternal life is in the next. It's with us today. So he, he, in, with the Gospels, he's trying to take care of how I'm immediately thinking and my relationship with God. Get my personal life balanced. But then he goes on to address another commandment, the new commandment, which he gives us in John chapter 13. So he's got us. And, and I'm not sure if it's the same as love, love your neighbor as yourself. But I think John chapter 13, the, the way he's stressing it, you know, verse 34, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. He keeps stressing that one. You've got to learn to love the brethren, right? And he's stressing it in 1 John as well. Learn to love one another. Now, here's where I believe that the, the letters, which are written totally differently from the Gospels, the letters are written to help us to discover and, and to find the fruits of the Holy Spirit. 
and develop the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are so important. When you've got those working within you, when you have those spiritual attitudes from the Holy Spirit, you don't have to worry about how you act because those just naturally teach you how to act. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say to people because those attitudes are generating what you need to be saying to people with kindness, goodness, gentleness, right? You develop those from the letters and they help you to be the person of God you need to be. You've got to get rid of bad worldly habits and replace them with good spiritual habits. See, so many people come into the body and they just think, okay, my sins are forgiven and now just press on, right? And and But I'm not changing. I'm not giving up my old, old life, dying to self. I'm taking on this spiritual life. You've got to let those bad habits go, right? And the thing is, nature abhors a vacuum. You can let those things go, but what do you need to replace them with? Because if you don't replace them with good habits, spiritual habits, guess what? The old comes back, which is exactly what Jesus reminds us of over in, in, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, verse 24 to verse 36. Because look, if I, if I clean, clean up your act, if you clean up your act with me, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and not finding any. It says, well, I'm going to go back to my house from which I came. And when it comes and finds it swept and put in order, then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they go in and they live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first state. Why? Because he became a Christian and he didn't start filling his heart with the word of God. He didn't start working with the Holy Spirit. Was it... He says something about in, in, in what in Second Peter, it would be better, if, you know, for him not to have known than to have known, you know, and be like a dog with its vomit, you know. You don't want to be like that. You want to learn to go. So you've got to learn to what? Adopt new habits. We we did it one time here with the with the Pepsi. Remember the glass of Pepsi? How do you empty a glass of Pepsi? Pepsi without touching it? Well, you've got to pour pure water in. And as you pour pure water in, the Pepsi just naturally comes out and overflows, right? Well, your heart is that glass of Pepsi, but you've got to pour in the pure water of the, of the word of God. And the only problem is the world is constantly pouring in more Pepsi because you keep seeing all of this worldly stuff. So you've got to find that balance where you're pouring in more word of God so that the Pepsi is still leaving and the, the, the things of this world aren't getting caught up inside of you. I've got to learn to adopt good habits if I hope to get rid of the bad. And that's exactly what he's trying to get through to us in, in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is a beautiful chapter. Why? Because it's got the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in it. But in Galatians chapter 5, listen to this. In verse 13, you were called to freedom, brethren. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care you are not consumed by one another. But I say walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing. These things, things like these of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You don't stand a chance if you continue to practice those things. And in 1 Corinthians, he says something in chapter 6, something about, and such were some of you. You practice those things. 
And we practice those things. We practice the darkness. But you came into the light. So you have to put that behind you. But to put it behind you, you have to adopt God's habits. Because he goes on to say, verse 22, the fruit of the spirit. What? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there are there is no law. Now those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. Learn to adopt the good habits. The warning that Paul's saying here, and he, he, he does it again beautifully in, in Colossians, though he doesn't bring up the idea of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Some of the things he says in Colossians are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But he's warning us, you've got to get rid of these things. And you've got to set your mind where? On things above. Chapter 3, Colossians. If you've been raised up with Christ, because when you come out of the waters of baptism, that's the first resurrection, and you're raised up and seated with Christ. Read Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2. If, you're, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You've got to get off the physical. You got to get into the spiritual, because if you stay with this, if you keep that physical foolishness in your head, you're going to get into massive trouble. Uh, just skipping over a few of these, we'll look at verse eight. But now you also put them aside. Here's that list again: anger, wrath, malice, slander, abuse of speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. But you've put on the new self as being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of. See, I didn't have a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Not when I was in the world. But I'm learning to develop those things, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, you also. Beyond all these things, put on love, the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called, in one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Mm. There's that beautiful thing called memory work. Work on it. It's easy to load. Your soul starves for the true word of God. That's all your soul wants. Everything else in the world, it's just pure trash. You know, you can think you're reading a great Christian book. It's just trash. Read the scriptures. The scriptures is what feeds the soul, right? Let the word richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another, Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness. In your, whatever you do, word or deed, all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. When you accomplish that, that's when you find life. Because life is not serving self. Life is serving other people. The fruit of the Spirit is this new life, is what... Paul's trying to get through to us. Do you remember Song of Solomon? We did that a while back. Song of Solomon, chapter five, was all about she had just become a Christian. He describes her in John in, in Song of Solomon, chapter four, as that beautiful garden. And he's describing all the fruits of the Holy Spirit as different plants in her life. You know, pomegranate, hena, and all of those plants, right? He describes nine plants, that's what she is. But then she says, may he come to my garden. And he says, I already have. And then she, he says, come follow me. And she says, well, I can't get out of bed. And he says, knocks on the door, come follow me. And then finally she gets up out of the bed. And then when she opens the door, he's gone. And then she goes to look for him on the street. Because what, what that chapter is teaching is she misunderstood. She thought she was saved to be served. 
she thought, now that I'm a Christian, God can serve me. Now I can get all these blessings, right? I'm staying in bed. You can breakfast in bed. I don't know. But what he's calling for her to do is you got to come out and serve. We're not saved to be served. We're saved to serve, to help other people. And when you're helping other people, that's when you get your greatest satisfaction. When you're helping other people, that's called life. That's true living. What do we say to people that are struggling with the depressions? Get out of yourself. Get out of the house. Go serve at a food kitchen. Go volunteer someplace. Because when you do, you actually see people who are really dealing with, with, with life and death. You know, And when you start to serve those people, you have a deeper appreciation for what life really is all about. Because that's what a Christian is designed to help others. What did Jesus say at the beginning of all of this? Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, or you can't be my disciple. You're not saved to, to be served, you're saved to serve. This, to me, is the new life. Eternal in its nature, a massive blessing, because he's just trying to help you to grow to be the person of God you, you, that you are. But our true goal in life is to what? love one another. That's what he wants us to do. And may that be an encouragement to all of us this morning. Thank you for your attention.